about December 69. Uh, I was invited to a uh, lecture by this Divine Grace, Asi Bhakti Vasa Swami Prabhupada. Well, I used to arrange festivals for Srila Prabhupada uh, when he used to come to the UK. And at that time he told me that he very much appreciated this festival. Prabhupada once said, with my history and the movement, I could easily cut myself a good profile in ISKCON, but that's not what it's about. So he was actually almost afraid. He was very careful to keep away from that prestige and, you know, being a big person in ISKCON. Although he was a big person, but he was, he was very careful to keep a low profile. He was also like, he was very philosophical, very, he had a very deep understanding of the experience of the, the conditioned soul in the material situation. You know, he understood psychology, emotions, experiences. He had a very, almost like an analytical understanding. He was like an expert psychologist, actually. He really knew what we were going through in this world and how the material energy works, how Maya works to grind us. Down. Very deep philosopher. One day in Guru Puja here, a person walked in that our younger generation had never seen before. Everybody who was older knew him, but not only knew him, knew him affectionately. There was just that mood. I remember thinking, who, who is this you know, celebrity person that we've never seen before? And he was completely British. He wasn't like he came in from America or somewhere else and just arrived here. And he was different. And I think it was because, and as I later got to know, he was completely unassuming. Even though he's a leader of us, he had the remarkable quality of just always being one of us. Tamil Krishnamaraj said that among devotees of the UK, Shabubhanath must have been the most popular of them all. And he said the remarkable thing was he was always on the fringe of it. He was never quite within the structure of it. His popularity was based upon his charm, his character. I remember Tamil Krishnamaraj remarked on the probably most inspiring and popular devotee of the UK, and he wasn't even within the structure. He was making a specific note of that. I did kind of um, ask him to take initiation. I asked him about twice or three times. He said, nah, nah, I don't want to give you, nah, I don't want to give you. This was even before he got sick. And then when I asked him the third time, he said, oh, I don't want to give. He said, but if I do give chai, you'll be my first disciple. There was one time when I was going through a little bit of difficult time. And then some devotees were really like getting on my case. Then he took me to the side and he says, I don't know why they're getting on your case and things like that. That just makes someone just go away. But he was always like very more loving, more compassionate kind of, rather than the chopping technique and things like that. I only met Sri Vibhanath one time, but the first thing Pratika heard him say was, I do festival. You know, he was really compassionate and appreciated everybody, and he never was judgmental about people, what kind of crazy people came. So he just made so many devotees. I'm not going to see how, like Parsharam, you know, he just compares everybody to Sri Vibhanath. And he just had that magic. He wanted everyone to be Krishna conscious. <laughs> I wish I could have it. <laughs> Some devotees I meet, God brothers I never knew, and it's kind of like, it's nice. But when I met him, it was immediately like we'd always just been together our whole life. And I felt that right away, and immediately best friends. And I think he was like that with everybody. He had that power, like Vishen John, and like Prabhupada. You never felt there was any formalities, any need for any. Pretense. was my uh, like a Siksha Guru. I always taking advice from him. And he used to carry Prabhupada's letter. He showed me that Prabhupada gave instruction to do festivals. So then I thought uh, Tivanath is really very dedicated uh, to see Prabhupada. So naturally I developed faith in him. He was very simple. Very, he can sleep on the floor. He can sleep on even a staircase. He was not 
carrying himself anything. No position, no name, nothing, always smiling, laughing. And he was no fear. Sometimes if you see, I have big disease, though we become very morous, what will happen? He was just laughing, but he was not much affected. So it's not particular, oh, one o'clock I will take lunch, this time I will take breakfast. He, her service was first. Any time he can eat, no problem. He can eat anything, anytime, without any demand. He was not maintaining, I'm proper disciple. I have I need a special treatment, a special thing. So everybody you have to be very close with him. He was not maintaining like this. Sometimes I see the proper disciple, they maintain I'm proper disciple, I'm very senior. No, he was not like that. So anybody can go very close to him. Sri Govanath Prabhu was very dear to Srila Prabhupada. When I hear about how Sri Bhuvanath left his body, you can't leave your body so easily unless it's arranged by Krishna. It's not possible to die that peacefully. Trivuvanath, from everything that everyone knows of him, was 100% engaged in his spiritual master and Krishna's service. And therefore, it's to be understood that he's gone back to Godhead. I remember the Gorpurnima procession we had through central London where he was leading the kirtan for over an hour. He had cancer, a very a virulent form of cancer, and yet there he was without uh, consideration and seemingly without difficulty leading that kirtan. Although it may have been difficult, he was so determined. I was very amazed by this. You know, I kept looking at him wondering, how is he able to do this? This is what we're working for. He has shown a perfect life. He's a pure devotee. He showed a perfect life. He's achieved perfection. But somehow, the temple was very enthusiastic. And I think Tribhuvanatha was the real cause of that enthusiasm. He was a very enthusiastic person. So I was running this incense business, and I get sometimes really caught up in it. We were making the incense, and then I would go and sell it. I was a new devotee, and I get a bit attached and get mental about things and Tribhuvanatha would come and say you need to go on Harinam just leave this business aside today you go out on Harinam and after I went out on Harinam then I, my mind would be a lot better and I could go back to do that business again yeah. so I really appreciated his uh, guidance at that time that he knew the power of Sankirtan and he encouraged me to take part in Sankirtan whenever things got too much for me mentally. That just go out on Harinam Sankirtan and spend the afternoon chanting and dancing and everything will be okay. So like that I was grateful for a lot of guidance, a lot of spiritual support I got from Sri Bhuvanatha. Tribhuvanatha get a lot of his helpful funding from Balabhadra and Ratnanjini in Scotland. And so, you know, Tribhuvanath would go up, they would give a kind donation, and, and he would leave. But he had a, a really nice relationship with them. When Ratna got sick, he would come up. He would be quite quiet, actually. And he'd get his donation, and he would go. But when she got very sick, and, and she had a brain tumor, so the, the way it affected her was quite funny, because she would say things she would never have said before. I was with her, it was just me and Ratna sitting in her room. And there was a knock on the door and Tribhuvanath came in and he was looking really cheeky. And that night she looked up and she came, oh, how much do you want now? And I was quite shocked, I was like, that now? And she came, well, you know what he's like, he's just here for the money. He just stood there and he was really quiet. And then he said, I haven't come for any money. He said, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate all your association right now. And he said, I've written you a poem. And he read the sweetest little poem that he'd written himself. I could see a tear coming out his eye. I didn't know what Ratna would say because she looked like she was going to cry, which wasn't something Ratna would do. And then Ratna said, oh, well, thank you for that. I didn't know you could write. And he said, it's not something I normally do, but for you, I wanted to write a poem. And then he, he went to leave the room and she said, uh, well, thank you for your association as well. It's not been too bad. And then it, it just about at the door she came, so, do you need any money? And he turned around and he said, no, not this time. I don't need any money this time. And he left. 
something would have a profound effect on your life, especially when you're a young devotee. And I think for someone like Tree Boven up to come to New Zealand was uh, pretty exemplary. And from the moment he stepped into the temple and started talking and started singing, he definitely captivated the Kiwis, that's for sure. He definitely captivated me. It was really inspiring. That's why I traveled with him on the bus. When I talk about him or his name comes up, this whole features come into my mind. You know, it did have a pretty big effect on me. His expertise, as far as I can figure out, he was like a Krista Dumna Maharaj, like Indy Swami of the day. They like to get out there and be out there preaching and preaching to people and preaching to devotees. I remember once we were on a bus in Africa. He wasn't driving, he was sat, and I was sat opposite him, and he was reading Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and he was reading out loud, and he stopped on the word peripatetic, and he loved that word, he just went on and on about it. It just occurred to me that, like, he is peripatetic. He means some kind of, like, person who travels, remember him, he said, oh, that's such a good word, yeah. every devotee should be peripatetic. Yeah, I remember him going on and on about that word, saying how devotees should just, like, have no, no attachments, should just, like, be free to roam, preach and just be completely dependent on Krishna and nobody else and it's like, yep, yeah, that's you, living out your black plastic bag and I think it was the same time our bus broke down in the middle of nowhere. I was thinking this is just it's typical, completely, he was just so, so much more dependent on Krishna than I could handle sometimes, it was just unreal. He just had no, he just didn't care. And I, we get so worried about this and that and we're we going to sleep, what we're we going to eat, where's the money going to come from and all the sort of things like normal human beings would worry about, he just didn't care at all. He was completely and utterly dependent on Krishna. Like genuinely. I couldn't believe it. It's kind of like, how do you go to your life like that? But yeah, he did. No problems whatsoever. Lunath had a very attachment to high-risk areas. So according to me, he was very, very sincere, honest, and the most gallant soldier I have ever seen of Prabhupada. He can go into various areas where we even were fearing to go. He was very keen in propagating Krishna consciousness in Uganda and particularly in this area where they are really starving for Krishna consciousness, we can say. So he kept on saying, we should go in the areas where the spiritual starving is the most, and we should use uh, the sharp distribution of attraction. So don't worry about their reactions of anger or threat, which is not easy for me at least to <laughs> do that. <laughs> he could pick risks beyond imagination as far as Krishna and preaching is concerned. So I wish he would have uh, got some extra years, but I don't know what is Krishna's plan. He was always emphasizing that we will work on his plan, not on my plan and your plan. So even in, uh, in the hospital he was saying that, that don't worry, Krishna must have planned something. We used to help them out with festivals, you know, in, in Ireland at least. I remember one particular festival in a place called Waterford. The theatre we got, it's one of the first theatres I think I've ever done a festival in that was like that, but it was like the stage was in, the, it was at the lowest level and it was an auditorium type thing. Like and it was packed, absolutely packed. I'm not sure how many people it held, but it didn't really matter because it was just so packed. It just, the atmosphere was just like electric, you know, and everything, everything was perfect, you know. The, the MC was perfect, you know, the lecture that Trevuvanad gave was absolutely perfect, really connected with the audience. Um, the drama was electric, it was like a, it was a comedy kind of drama, so it was about not being the body basically. The crowd loved it, they were in stitches with it and it went down really, really well. And the kirtan, the final kirtan was just, you know, the whole auditorium was up, you know. That festival would be one of the you know, one of the highlights of my Krishna conscious uh, life actually, you know, just, just the atmosphere. I remember after we were all buzzing, you know, like everybody was buzzing, you know, all, all, all the festival team, the devotees that were involved in the dramas and all the different things. 
you know, it was almost like you know, drugs or something like that. It was just, it was just so electric, actually, the whole whole experience. You know, it was really, really good. That's a memory that I'll definitely that Waterford Festival that night. I'd never forget it. It was really good. He used to tell me that all the time. I wish I could chant more. I wish I could, you know, read Prabhupada's books more. I need to study more. And he, he's always saying, I need to study more. <laughs> he's always saying that. He really had a taste for chanting. Every night, he would always be up late chanting. Every time I would go to bed, he would be up chanting. I says, when are you taking rest? He would say, oh, I've still got rounds to chant. He must have finished his rounds, because he did them in the morning as well. But he, he says, no, no, I'm chanting extra rounds. I'm trying to chant extra rounds. I says, how many rounds do you chant? Well, I try and chant maybe 20, 25. He was doing more than that. He must have been doing 40, 50, 60 rounds, maybe even. And he never told us how many rounds he'd chant. I would, sometimes I'd be up really late. He'd still be like, maybe up chanting. Never slept in the bed. He'd always, he would mostly sleep sitting in a chair. But many times I would say, oh, please, when I was coming, you know, at least take some rest. Please, you know, have an early night. He said, no, no, sleeping is like death. I hate, I hate sleep. <laughs> it's a waste of time. It's a complete waste of time, he said. <laughs> And I think that was his only concern, you know, that devotees collect so much money, but they're not spending enough money for preaching. That was his major concern. I think that's the only, that's the only real complaint I ever heard him make. We went to a place called Zomba, which is in Malawi, and they, they never heard of Krishna or Hare Krishna. Uh, so we went to the, this university, it was a big, big hall, and like 600 seats or maybe a thousand. So we did the festival, he was giving the talk, and at first there was just uh, about 20 people. And as the program went on, more and more students started to arrive in the hall. By the time he started the lecture, the hall was full. The whole university came. He was giving a very uh, deep lecture for the students. Can you imagine? the top brains of that country in front of Tribuna. And he, he went into a sort of a mood of Bhakti Siddhanta. But he was giving the talk and appealing to the students' intelligence and very, very philosophical, very high-level intellectual presentation. But also simple, not like a show, not like just using some fancy words very precise logic and some humor. I noticed that he was uh, actually going into ecstasy when he was speaking. He was trying to contain his ecstasy. He was almost slurring his words. If you think about the occasion that very few devotees go to Africa, and mostly they go to South Africa because it's a bit like Europe. If you think about Lord Chaitanya's mission to save most fallen people, so there's Tribuna going into the middle of a very obscure, random African country and going right to the top brains. That's the university of the whole country. They're not stupid people. They're, they're you know, highly intellectual. So he's giving them Krishna consciousness. So it's quite an occasion. And uh, is, uh, I think uh, he had that connection with the parampara coming down through him. That's my humble, unqualified observation. Yeah, Trevor was an amazing soldier. They're following me, I'm leading the way, I know all the shortcuts downtown. We get into the Sudan Airways office, and there's this Sudanese lady, and she's like, I'm sorry, there's no flights till next year. And Dwarka's having a whole number. Hey, what are you talking about? We have all these people there to get back to work in London. Blah, 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 blah. I can't help you. The, the regional officer who would normally be here has gone on an early vacation. Big scene, shouting, arguing. The lady's getting upset. Stop my fault. And Dwarka, it is your fault. You represent the airline. Karunas just sitting in the back all cool and chilled out. He could see it was getting quite heated. Karunas really he mediated. Okay, Dwarka, just, you know, sit down, relax. And he looked at the lady and said, look, just please see what you can do for us. We are missionaries and we're here spreading the word of God. Can you just try and see what you can do to help us? And then she said, I remember you people. When I was a young stewardess and we would fly to London, I would go with my friends and we would go shopping on that Oxford Street. And I would see you people singing and dancing with your music, singing this Rama Krishna Hare. And I would just give my shopping bags to my friends. I would go and dance with you. 
I would go with you down that long Oxford Street, and I was looking at Trebuvanath, and he was just like smiling in an ecstasy, because it was mo more than likely it was him who was leading those kirtans. And she says, "Okay, I remember you people made me happy. I will do something for you." At the time, I just come here, and somehow I wanted to help him. And I was given some money when we left the firm. And somehow, he's one of these people that said, "Look, how can I help you?" He really, yeah. and I didn't really know him other than that time he was on the Isle of Wight and they were doing the Harry Nuts there. And he taught me so much in the, just this his mode because he wasn't pushing me, but somehow there was something in him that made you want to give to him or give to his, his mission. You know, I kept finding myself saying, is there anything else you need? You know, it just, it was, it was just like, it was the most natural thing in the world. I mean, just about Jerubnath in general, like his mood was so sweet. He really, he was always about supporting the group boys and just helping us find that spark in Krishna. Um, that was really important to him, that we all had that attachment and that want to, to share and spread Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's message. Um, he'd even talk to us about philosophy and and why, you know, the importance of, of chanting and book distribution and Harinam. Sankitan, he died. As we all know, Bhuvanath was a very good Kirtan leader. He used to play the Mridanga and he enjoyed dancing in Kirtans. He was very enthusiastic about Kirtan and he also had a strong desire to preach. We had a very good relationship, very friendly, and I was indebted to him for the service he did for Vrindavan Temple at that time and he agreed to collect. The idea that he should collect for Vrindavan was given by me and he agreed to do the service. I did meet Tribunath in Africa. I think I met him once or twice and I encouraged him to do his safari. But Tribunath was always very enthusiastic and very dedicated to Prabhupada. There was one time in Dublin, he was really fried because he came, he flew back from Africa and he got back like really late at night and then he was up by four o'clock. It was after the marathon one year. Everyone got up and then he started chanting and Tribunar was really jet lagged so it was real, there was a storm going outside so he went outside and he started pacing up and down, walking up and down on the seafront with this gale force wind blowing on him so that he could stay awake and chant his rounds. And meanwhile, inside, everyone else, one by one, flaked off and went back to bed. So then he comes in about seven o'clock to do Guru Puja, and he got really fried, you know. He got super fried that everybody, he said, he called everyone a bunch of lazy heads, and started shouting at everybody, and he started saying, don't make a mockery of Prabhupada's movement. That's one thing I remember, one phrase he used, he said, don't make a mockery of Prabhupada's movement. If you're not going to make an effort here, he said, then just go out and be a karmi. But be a good karmi. Don't be just a bunch of lazy heads. That was his exact words. So he was super fried, you know. And I just remember sitting there taking this like onslaught and I thought, God, Jesus. That's the point he was trying to make, is that Krishna consciousness is not just some kind of joke. But well, Tribuna had a certain standard that he expected people to follow. He was very insistent on people having a standard of Krishna Consciousness implemented. People may go on about Trubhuvanath's mission. Trubhuvanath's mission was to serve Krishna. That was Trubhuvanath's mission. It wasn't just go around preaching, preaching, preaching for the sake of preaching, but not practicing anything to do with Krishna Consciousness. Two memories stand out in my mind. One was being in Africa somewhere 
and meeting him with his bust. I was in a fairly comfortable position sitting in one place and he and his group were bombing around in this bus in difficult countries with bus that was, as I recall, in need of mechanical attention. And they were just really on the ground doing the frontline work and not resting comfortably, not just talking, but really on the front lines, really working. And it, it was so impressive to me that he was more than a sannyasi in that regard, that he was not considering risk, not considering do we have support here or not support here, but just going out and doing it and depending on Krishna, which is the standard for a pure devotional service and renounced life and preaching in, in that spirit. So it was very impressive to me. Jai Dwedaswami was very much encouraging him to take sannyas, even in a class. Jai Dwedaswami mentioned that Tribhuvanath should take sannyas. And he said he wanted Tribhuvanath to take disciples, but Tribhuvanath was felt very unqualified. But I think because he'd, he'd left for that time, he was still very regretful about that and felt unqualified. We went to Mayapur together, and I remember during this big kirtan, the Swamis were all dancing together, and we were hoping he would just sort of join in, but he wouldn't, he just stood at the back. He was just looking at the deities, and there was just this incredible look of humility about him. It was quite, quite bizarre. He really tried to stay out of the limelight. There were several devotees who saw him as their guru, so there was a lot of pressure on him at that stage. Eventually he snapped and said okay. But that was shortly before he, he was diagnosed. It probably would have been great, but anyway. But I do remember he was very, very cautious about pride and position. So I think he was quite fearful of taking that position. Very cautious. There's a whole saga about whether I should get a job or whether I should go back and stay with the Hare Krishnas. And of course my parents were super keen to give me some interviews. And I went for a job interview and they offered me the engineering job. And then I went and spoke to Shrubhavan after he was in Dublin. And he said a few things. He said, many, many people have done what you're thinking about doing. Yeah, yeah, I'll just go home, I'll get a job, and I'll continue practicing Krishna consciousness. But you might be different, but none of them have made it. They all just flake out with Krishna consciousness. So I went home then, and it was like, I said to my parents that, they said, well, I don't know if I'm going to take it. And then they started freaking out. So I thought, I'm very confused here about what to do. And then I was on the phone to Shraguna, and uh, Jimmy's sitting in the living room with him. He was saying to Jimmy, I'm not going to let him go. Jimmy told me later. He's a good kid, he says, I'm not going to let this one go. He said, what you're doing now is just plain selfishness. It sounds quite heavy to tell someone selfish. You, you, you kind of think that, well, like, what's selfish about it? just getting a job, you know? But then I began to think, like, the sacrifices that he made for service to Prabhupada and for service to Krishna. And when he said that, actually, it felt like to me... He stuck his hand down the phone and grabbed my mind by the ear and gave it a good tug and dragged me back to Birmingham, basically. If it wasn't for that, I do question whether I would have continued practicing Krishna consciousness because to be very new and then to leave the association of devotees prematurely could spell disaster in the spiritual life of a new person. I was talking to Mother Vrinda about it. She was listening and then she said after, Oh, you owe him. You owe him a debt. I feel somewhat unhappy because I missed the opportunity of the association as such a unique and very loving person, dynamic in all sense of the word. And I always felt that here was a devotee that I guess maybe was not given the credit that he actually was due. He was really, really an amazing person. He was just exemplary in all ways. Shabunath had a very special relationship with Prabhupada. Shabunath was an orphan and he didn't know his father. So Prabhupada was like, he was like his father. I mean, Shabunath loved Prabhupada. He had, you know, had a much closer relationship with Prabhupada than I had. You know, he was the temple president in Edinburgh. Now, Shabunath, he worked directly for Prabhupada. He didn't work for anybody else. Prabhupada was his authority. He didn't have any other authority. Our God brother Tribhuvanath Prabhu, he worked hard day and night and preached and made so many festivals and made so many devotees. He had a very clear understanding of all the principles in Prabhupada's books and he was fearless in every respect. 
He wasn't afraid to go into universities with all professors and just preach Christian consciousness. He was very straightforward and say all evolutionary theory is all bogus. And without any scientific background, just with the teachings of Bhagavad Gita as he had heard them from Prabhupada. So definitely he got the full mercy of Srila Prabhupada. He was fully engaged in the preaching mission. So in this way it's it's clear that he got the full mercy of Srila Prabhupada. I remember uh, Mother Mekala Jesta, we were speaking in the Rose Garden. And uh, Mekala said something about Shabu Math Prabhu leaving. I made the comment that uh, separation from all Vaishnavas is a uh, horrible thing. And, and she, uh, she said, no. Shibhuvanath's not an ordinary Vaishnava. He's a, he's a special Vaishnava. And uh, I remember that. That made me think it, it is a fact. There are many Vaishnavas, but as you could see from that uh, video, even uh, when someone's practically on the threshold uh, of death, like Srila Prabhupada was writing, Shibhuvanath is chanting, singing. I could see his voice was so weak, it was difficult for him to even sing in tune. Jibhubhanath Prabhu Ki Jai.